Well, you're all very welcome. Uh, my name is Paulig Murphy. Uh, I have a duty to tell you at the beginning to uh, please turn off your mobile phones, as I shall do with my own. Uh, we are fortunate to have with us today um, a man who has uh, left Moscow this week. Yes. Uh, I won't say that uh, he is the man that has brought the biting cold wind from Siberia with him. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> because he is a Frenchman and French people don't bring biting cold winds with them. Um, our speaker is uh, Jacques Sapir, who is a French economist and who has been the director of studies at uh, the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris since 2006. Uh, but he also teaches um, at the Moscow School of Economics. Uh, the subject of the talk is the economic and development <coughs> challenges facing Russia, a matter of uh, persistent interest among all of us. Uh, we have been observing the uh, Russian economy uh, with uh, bated breath for some, what, uh, 27 years now. Um, there is uh, the question of the uh, Russian approach to economic development, uh, which varies uh, and has varied under the presidency of Vladimir Putin from, uh, let's say, a more liberal direction to a more state-directed direction. Uh, there is the question of uh, the Western sanctions on Russia, which have some impact on the Russian economy. But nevertheless, uh, it seems that uh, after a recession, between 2014 and 2016, uh, the Russian economy is in better shape than many of us had anticipated. So uh, Jacques, um, as an expert, we look forward greatly to hearing your views on the situation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, first, <coughs> I want to thank uh, the Institute for inviting me. Uh, let me see. OK. Uh, and I shall present you first an assessment and then uh, some problems uh, which are uh, to face uh, the Russian economy uh, in uh, the next two or three years. Uh, the first thing okay, is to understand uh, where Russia stands now. And as you can see, uh, the drop in production, which was mostly not all, but mostly linked uh, to the huge fall of oil price uh, since uh, the end of 2014 and in 2015, has, of course, uh, induced a huge uh, drop, but uh, this trend has been first stabilized uh, by 2016, and uh, by the beginning, or more precisely by mid 2017, uh, again, uh, Russia began uh, to grow. This is the first time, thing. Uh, the second very important thing is to look what has happened to different uh, sectors of the Russian economy. Uh, the red line is the industry, the blue line is the construction, and you can see that uh, industry has been regularly over uh, 100 person, uh, it's important to understand it's year-to-year -year growth. It's not uh, month to month. It's year-to-year, -year, uh, what we call in French the sliding growth. Um, so it's a proof that it is the industry which first reacted very positively uh, to this situation. Uh, the situation in construction is much more troubled with uh, some very big drops, some very big, of course, moves up. And this is partly, uh, I shall go back uh, to this point later, um, this is partly linked uh, to the situation of household credits, which is mostly uh, housing credits. Now you have the inflation. And this is very interesting. 
The first thing is uh, the big high, uh, which was induced by the huge depreciation of the ruble uh, by the end of 2014 and the early 2015. Um, this big high was very, very uh, quickly digested. But then you have another quite interesting problem. Uh, look, uh, this is the moving average uh, on six months, which is, of course, much more reliable uh, than month to month rate. OK, you are seeing the high. You are seeing a kind of shadow of this high, which is more or less one year later. This was uh, absolutely uh, normal. But after that, what happened? The rate of inflation began to go down. So to the point that it's going down right now at the level unearthed since the beginning of Russia. Uh, the current rate, the current yearly rate, or on two consecutive months rate of inflation is 2.5%. Never before the inflation in Russia went under 5%. This is quite interesting because um, this is showing that a big part of inflation, which was linked uh, to the inflation of imported goods, uh, as, uh, well, is not be stopped as at least reduced. Then we have the process of investment in fixed capital. Uh, investment in fixed capital, of course, raised very, very much uh, from 2002 uh, to 2008. Then you had uh, the financial crisis after a resumption of uh, this I. Of course, uh, this rate uh, dropped down, but you can see, and that's quite interesting, that uh, the drop began in 2013, not 2014 which could uh, lead us to suppose that part of this height was actually linked to infrastructure project linked to the Olympic Games in Sochi, and that the actual level was far lower. You know. But then it is again uh, resuming uh, its growth. Labor productivity, that's quite in important because in economic uh, terms, it's the productivity of labor which is driving uh, the economic growth. And this is on this, on this particular aspect that we are to make some international comparison. And now uh, you can see that the labor productivity uh, had a significantly higher rate of growth than uh, the labor productivity in the USA. This is quite interesting, you know. Actually, a lot of people are saying, well, um, uh, the Russian economy is stagnating. It's not true when it comes to uh, labor productivity. And what is the more interesting is the fact that this growth in labor productivity was not uh, followed by an increase in an unemployment. The unemployment level was still between 5.2-5.5% 5 5 uh, of the productive population. This is, uh, of course, quite an interesting result. Now, this is a result also hiding huge difference between uh, different activities. The manufacturing uh, industry uh, and a very much higher rate of growth than all other sectors of the economy. The construction, which moved up very, very quickly uh, in the early 2000s, after that, more or less stabilized. Uh, after that, you have also uh, sectors like utilities, like fisheries, which has no practically no rate of growth or very limited rate of growth since uh, 2002. So it's extremely important to understand that the divergence in the rate of 
growth of labor productivity has been absolutely tremendous. Again, you can see that uh, activities like transportation and communication, uh, also wholesale and retail trade, have a rate of growth higher than the economy as a whole, but have dropped actually for wholesale and retail trade quite a lot uh, in 2015. Well, this is probably the, the result of the fact that a lot of companies, of Russian companies, uh, are not firing uh, their employees when uh, the production or the level of activity is decreasing. Just because uh, they are thinking or forecasting the fact that uh, this drop in economic activities is not uh, to stay for very long. After that, uh, the rate of growth of the economy will move up again and they will have a direct need uh, of employees. You, know. uh, you have to know that there is a, a real shortage uh, in Russia of uh, people who, who had a medium to high level education right now. It's not a shortage in general, it's a shortage by comparison with the need of the economy. And this is certainly affecting um, the trajectory of labor productivity. Now, problem number one, population income. Population income is coming first uh, from the real wage. And we can see that since September, October 2016, uh, the six months average mean or three months average mean of real wage, real wage has ever been uh, very much over uh, zero. Now, quite an interesting, an interesting thing. The blue line is retail trade. Retail trade has growing much faster than real wage from 2000 to 2008. Now it's the reverse, which means that the money get by people, get by household, is not going, or is not going completely into the retail trade. And you have to know that this curve is not just looking at the traditional retail trade, but it's now uh, introducing the e-trade uh, in computations. Which means that uh, you have all the sources of uh, impact of the income, of household income, uh, which have to be taken uh, into account. And you can see here, through the revenue side of the budget, the first thing absolutely obvious is the decrease in oil and gas revenue. Uh, 6.4 trillion of rubles in 2012, 4.8 trillion in 2016. But in the same time, non oil and gas revenues grew, and they grew mostly because other revenues uh, have grown. Uh, will be the excise tax. Uh, will it be uh, the corporate income tax? Uh, will it be the personal income tax? <coughs> and of course, social contribution. You know, 4.1 trillion in 2012, 6.3 trillion uh, in 2016. So, uh, the oil and gas revenues went down to 27.5% in 2012 to 17% in 2016. And uh, the other non-oil and gas re uh, revenues moved up. Which implies that a part of household incomes has been sucked by the fiscal system. This is pretty important. 
And this is explaining why uh, there is so strong a problem, not with real wage, but with household incomes. Now, we have to look onto household debt and uh, non-personal household debt, which is mostly uh, the debt onto construction or the mortgage debt. This is, the blue line is uh, the nominal weight of wage, of uh, debt, sorry, and here is the real, the deflated uh, amount uh, of debt. This is quite interesting. Till August of last year, the level of debt was under the level of January uh, 2016. So actually, households have decreased their amount of debt, which is perfectly understandable uh, if you look to the level of actual rates uh, on them. But it's also linked to the fact that household income have decreased in 2015 and 2016. And since August, November uh, 2017, as it's very uh, probable that household income has again began to grow, we can see the level of debt growing up quite quick. Problem number two, the divergence of investment growth. Uh, this is quite interesting if you are looking again uh, to different sectors uh, of uh, the Russian economy. The extractive industry and the oil and gas industry have known a constant grow up of investment. There is absolutely no break in the curve. And this is quite interesting because it proved that financial sanctions had absolutely no effect on the Russian industry, at least in these sectors. Uh, I'm not to be so affirmative uh, in, in other sectors, but for these sectors, that's absolutely obvious. Uh, the extraction, the mineral extraction also moved up in 2015. A bit here, uh, which is pretty normal considering uh, the specificities of this sector. So, when it comes to natural, uh, or to raw material extraction, the investment still was growing up. Now, if you look to, uh, well, manufacturing industry, First, look at what happened for the production of vehicles and transportation. A very, a very huge coming up, a very huge hike uh, in 2014, well, coming from uh, 2010 to 2014. After that, a drop, which is absolutely understandable uh, if you look uh, to the demand uh, for vehicle on the Russian market. You know that the demand for vehicle uh, was more or less halved in 2015 and 2016. Now, unfortunately, I don't have uh, the data for 2017. And uh, now it seems, uh, well, by uh, some discussion I had uh, with people from Renault and from different companies, that again, this is moving up. We are seeing also the same trend, less, you know, less accentuated, but still the same trend for the metallurgical industry and, of course, for the production of uh, machine and equipment. But there is one sector of the industry, of the manufacturing industry, which had a, a kind of curve which is absolutely similar with the one of the extracting industry 
for the oil and gas industry, chemicals. And this is linked to a major break onto the world market by a huge chemical corporation, huge Russian chemical corporation. Of course, it is not what could be called the very precise chemicals. It's mostly a huge production of azote uh, and things like that. But uh, this production is now making a growing and growing part of Russian exports. And this is extremely important because this is a proof that to some point Russia has been uh, ready or has been capable to move from only raw material uh, exports to semi-processed uh, material exports. Uh, I'm not to, to clarify uh, the chemical industry other than semi-processed, but nonetheless, this is uh, a move which is relatively new in uh, the Russian economy. Same thing now for high-tech production. Uh, you can see here uh, the production of uh, office equipment which has went up very quickly and then is going down as quickly. But there is here something which is quite interesting. The production of uh, medical equipment. And the production of medical equipment has been growing very regularly uh, since 2002 and was not affected by this big downturn uh, for 2015 or 2016. The main reason, in my opinion, is the fact that most of the demand for uh, medical equipment is coming from the state or for, uh, from institutions which are related to the state. Now, from where these investments come? Uh, the first point is uh, the share between internal funding and external funding of investment. <coughs> internal funding, uh, sorry, made a mistake, it's external, it's external funding here. External funding <coughs> crossed uh, the border of 50% uh, in uh, 2000. And since then, it came at nearly 63%. Now, and this is 2009, it began to go down. First, pretty slowly, then very much quickly. This implies that foreign investment uh, in Russia, or more precisely, uh, foreign funds funding uh, the investment in Russia has decreased even before 2014. It has began to decrease in 2010. And this is very probably linked to the big financial crisis, the Lehman Brothers crisis, that we, uh, we have known uh, in the world. After that, this new drop uh, can be mostly attributed uh, to economic sanctions. This is pretty obvious. But what is quite interesting is the fact that Russia has found a way uh, to overcome uh, these sanctions and to replace some foreign funding by some Russian funding for the external growth uh, of investment. It is not the state, or more precisely, the size of state investment decreased very quickly uh, since 1998 to 2004. After that, it was more or less constant. Of course, you have a, a small height in 2015, uh, but it's not very significant. Another much more interesting point is inter-enterprise loans 
And, and, and there is here a problem of data. We don't uh, have the data for 2015 and 2016. Um, I believe that probably the curve is here, but I have absolutely uh, no mean uh, to, uh, to have the official data on that. Okay, uh, funding coming from holding in person of external funding and enter enterprise loans have grown to the fact that they are both representing between 40% of external funding. What does it mean? It means that it's mostly very big enterprise, some of them state-owned, like Gazprom, Rosneft, things like that, uh, which are funding the investment of other enterprise. And this is creating a network of dependency of these enterprises toward the state enterprise, which is pretty important. After that, uh, you have also the fact that bank credit has increased a bit in 2016. Uh, remember, we are talking only of external investment, external funding of investment. So it means that <coughs> bank loans are making, at best, 10% of the total investment funding, as uh, external and internal are more or less equal. But what we are seeing here is the fact that uh, the Russian state is helping banks uh, to loan to enterprise. This is different kind of subsidization uh, of loans, which has been particularly important for the agriculture. Now, the problem is that um, this is raising two different issues. The first issue is the fact that still now, raw material and semi-processed material are still driving up investment in Russia. This is a problem. But another problem, and to my opinion, much more important, is the fact that the probable size of a state or state-related enterprise into uh, the funding of new investment has grown quite a bit uh, in the last five years. It's a process which began actually before uh, the political conflict uh, in which Russia has been involved. Uh, but um, it is growing and it is now probably reaching between 60 and 70 percent of all funding, both internal and external. To some extent, this is making the Russian economy now much more similar to the pre-revolution, the 1913 uh, Russian economy, than to the Soviet economy, because it was already the situation in 1930. Um, it was a point that I have studied a bit uh, some years ago, and uh, I had uh, a PhD student, uh, a young, uh, young Russian lady, she became French uh, after, uh, named Tatiana Speranskaya. She is now working in Geneva uh, in Rosneft trading. Uh, but she wrote a brilliant uh, PhD. And she was already showing in 2011 that the Russian banking system was becoming more and more like what was the Russian banking system uh, in, in uh, 1913. So we can speak to a kind of return to the model of pre-revolutionary Russia. Last point, credit debt and investment. The non-financial house uh, debt in national currency 
uh, is going, going up, but this is to some point uh, because the debt into foreign currency, mostly the US dollar, uh, has go down very, very quickly because of the huge depreciation of the rule, point one, and because of economic sanctions. So we had a kind of transfer between national currency and foreign currency, which is uh, explaining why we had, and this is a green curve, uh, we had the global debt, which has been good going down in 2016, and is only quite slowly uh, moving up right now. And the explanation is here. Here you have the blue line, the weighted average interest rates on which loans are extended. This is going down with uh, the movement of inflation, but not so much, you know. Uh, we are moving from 14 percent uh, to more or less 10.5 uh, percent. In the same time, inflation went down much more rapidly, which implies that real interest rates have moved up to a very considerable level. Actually, uh, real interest rates were around 5% uh, in uh, mid-2016, and right now, in early uh, 2018, they are at least at 7%. And you understand perfectly that 7% for real interest uh, rate, this is driving out of the banking system, driving out of uh, the lending system, most enterprise and part of the population. Now, a last point uh, to have a complete view of the situation. The evolution of the National Wealth Fund the National Wealth Fund was at $88 billion in early 2014. It went down from August 2014 to January 2015, and very probably uh, to help Russian enterprise uh, to digest the first row of economic sanctions. After that, enterprise adapted themselves and the National Wealth Fund was still going from uh, 75 uh, to 72 billion US dollars. This is not very significant. But then, we are seeing from uh, September uh, 2017 up to January 2018, another drop of nearly 10 million. This is very probably pre-election spending. <laughs> Problem number three, an economic uh, policy and consistency. And this is a very serious problem. Look at the budget expenditure. This is in share. Uh, you can see, of course, the huge increase in defense, which is, of course, much less obvious if you are looking onto uh, constant price real level. But as a percent of the expenditure side uh, of the Russian budget, they have increased much. In the same time, law and order decreased. So we can think that there is a kind of balance between uh, expenditure for law and order and expenditure for defense. What is quite interesting is the fact that uh, in person, the social policy went down in 2014, but then quickly went up, you know. So the social policy <coughs> has been left more or less uh, unchanged. Uh, education went down 
uh, quite significantly. And, uh, and this is also quite interesting, housing and utilities infrastructure. When I ask some questions uh, to people in the Ministry of Finance, they told me that the state has moved out from the housing uh, sector and concentrated all uh, its uh, money on the financing of utilities infrastructure. Nonetheless, this is explaining also the drop in construction that we have seen at the very beginning. Now, the Russian budget at constant price. And you can see here that there is <coughs> quite a movement down uh, in 2015 and 2016 for the revenue side, but which is much less pronounced for the expenditure side. So, to my opinion, uh, if the monetary policy is actually a quite restrictive one, and this is obvious uh, by the level of uh, real interest rates, the budgetary policy, the budget policy, has been something between uh, austerity and <coughs> Uh, level or a normal budget policy. It's a policy that I would qualify as austere, but certainly not as an austerity regime, because you can see uh, the budget deficit went up quite significantly. Uh, and because, as uh, we have seen also, um, the social policy budget was more or less equal uh, in proportion, even went a bit up uh, in 2015 and 2016 after the big drop of uh, 2014. Uh, you can see the same data, but then computed in person, and you can see that the decrease in revenue has been uh, quite obvious, but the decrease of expenditure much less. So this is, again, a confirmation that uh, the budget policy uh, in Russia has been austere, but not an austerity regime. So uh, let me, uh, to conclude, with uh, some view uh, on the challenge facing the new Russian government, or the government we, which will come to power after the election, after the election of Vladimir Putin, of course. Uh, first. Russia is to face the consequences of a very restrictive monetary policy. And this policy cannot stay with us, but if the state is to increase its involvement, both in the funding of investment and in the support of household incomes. There is a trade-off. If Russia want to maintain a very restrictive monetary policy, or more precisely, if the leading body in the Russia Central Bank want uh, to stay with a very restrictive monetary policy, the state will have no other option than to increase its involvement. It will increase its involvement very probably uh, in following the line of a relatively austere budget policy, that is, not by spending in all di uh, different uh, directions, but it's spending in a very uh, precise areas, which are the social policy budget, which is to increase, and which seems to have increased uh, in 2017. You know that uh, the ultimate data for 2017, uh, we don't have so far. But here again, by discussing uh, with colleagues, by discussing with people uh, from uh, the Ministry of Finance, um, I am pretty sure that um, the, uh, the social policy budget is probably around 36 or even 36.5% uh, 
uh, of the total expenditure side, which means that there is a very significant uh, budget in social policy. Um, the other uh, priority uh, for the budget policy is, of course, defense. And defense is to be a very important item uh, in, uh, in, uh, in public expenditures. Now, uh, we have to understand that this combination of a very restrictive monetary policy and an austere uh, budget policy is raising a problem of reaching the very ambitious targets set up by the government. The Russian government is uh, making a 4% a year growth a target. Actually, there is a lot of economists, uh, mostly uh, in the Academy of Science, uh, and, and people uh, who I respect a lot, who are saying that um, the actual target will have to be 6%. And uh, with this combination of monetary policy and budget policy, it is not possible uh, to have a growth of over 2% a year. Of course, 2% a year is, by European standard, uh, quite a significant growth. But we have to understand that um, the economic situation in Russia is not uh, the economic situation uh, in Europe. So I perfectly understand why uh, the Russian officials, why people in the Russian government uh, are wanting to have a much higher growth. Nevertheless, it is not possible to have this growth with the kind of policy mix they have right now. Which is also raising another issue. Is there an official economic policy uh, which is contradicted by uh, an implicit economic policy. What I call an implicit economic policy is a policy um, generated by decision made by the government even without intent to reach uh, these decisions. Uh, this is the fact that by adopting uh, the kind of monetary policy they have adopted, they have driven the financial system inside the government and not outside. The same situation with investment. The official economic policy is to say, we want to develop private investment. But the actual fact is a growing share of state in national investment. So there is actually an official economic policy and a policy which is, with good faith, followed by government official. And there is also an economic policy uh, generated by uh, the end result of decision made uh, last year or even the year before, and which is driving the Russian economy more and more toward the state. This is major a problem. So the necessity to act consistently will be a challenge for the next government. Uh, the reaction of the next government to this challenge will depend on three things. First, uh, the way it will perceive this conflict between an official and an implicit economic policy. Will it acknowledge this fact or will it deny this fact is still um, to be seen, but this will be the, f the first reason uh, explaining what will be the new economic policy. The second problem is, of course, uh, the general context. And my feeling, but I'm too precise, it's my feeling, uh, is the fact that still Russia will be uh, in a situation of political confrontation 
with the United States and with the European Union, uh, there, is, there will be no other way for them than uh, to be driven toward a state system. And this is a very important problem. And the third point is, of course, the quality of women and men who will be the government. Of course, uh, the new prime minister is not to be someone who could challenge uh, the rule of Vladimir Putin. But it is not uh, the prime minister who will make the difference. So we, it will be the minister of finance, uh, the minister of economic development, and things like that. And even under them, you know, uh, people like um, uh, the minister, uh, vice minister, uh, head uh, of uh, central administration. Okay. And it is extremely important to understand that with the election, there will be a process of changeover uh, in the central administration. This process um, will be marked by a quite an important uh, entry into this level of administration of young people. This is already forecast. Uh, actually, uh, uh, young people are already online, you know, uh, waiting to know what are positions which are to be liberated uh, in the new government. But there is also a social dimension in that. With the infusion of new people, people who are between 30 and 40 years old, we will have an infusion of people which are pretty, uh, pretty well trained, be, uh, be they in Western university or in Russian universities, which are right now at the same level uh, of the best uh, Western universities. And these people are free from the inheritance of the Soviet system. So how these new people will react uh, to the challenge facing uh, the Russian economy is something to be seen uh, with some trepidation. Thank you.